Galacto Bareco and baklava are traditional Greek desserts. Although several European and Middle Eastern countries have versions of baklava, most consist of phyllo pastry filled with nuts, drenched in honey or syrup. Galacto Bareco is phyllo filled with custard and coated with sweet syrup. This variety of baklava, called burma, is made not with phyllo dough like classic baklava, but with kata ifi, shredded wheat dough. Burma, like classic phyllo baklava, contains whole pistachios, never pistachio powder. This Burma chef pours granulated sugar over the pistachio kernels. Next, he sprinkles rose water, although this ingredient is optional. Then, syrup made with sugar, water, cinnamon, and nutmeg, as well as lemon to prevent the sugar from later crystallizing. He mixes by hand to thoroughly coat the kernels. The kata ifi is made of all-purpose flour, milk, and water. The chef lays out a section of dough, then takes a handful of pistachio filling and places it on the dough, forming a line running down the middle. For a Burma loaf this size, the filling is about an inch wide and high. He folds the end closed and rolls the dough at an angle down the length of the Burma, tightly encasing the filling as he goes. At the end, he folds the opposite end closed. It takes a Burma chef months to perfect this technique. He places it on a tray to air dry for 24 hours to ensure the dough maintains its rolled shape. Unlike classic baklava, which is baked, Burma is fried, and the risk of burning the pistachios makes this the most technically challenging type of baklava to make. The chef fries the loaves for three minutes in oil heated to around 350 degrees Fahrenheit, turning them once per minute. He lets the oil drain off for half an hour. Then, he pours warm caramelized sugar over the loaves and lets them soak for 20 minutes. The sugar to water ratio and the boiling time of the caramelized sugar have to be just right. Otherwise, it will become either too hard or too gooey when it cools. After letting the excess drain off, the loaves rest for about three hours. Then the chef rolls the loaf to flatten out the bumps and slices it into equal pieces. But if there's a protracted battle waging between your sweet tooth and your willpower, you've got plenty of time to work your way through a box of Burma because it stays fresh for two weeks. To make Galacto Bareco, the chef begins with two ingredients, milk and semolina. After bringing the milk to a boil, he gradually adds the semolina while whisking and lowering the temperature. Once the mix thickens, he sets it aside to cool. In a separate bowl, the chef whisks eggs, adds vanilla, then lemon or orange rind. Other options are orange blossom or rosewater extract. He transfers the ingredients to an electric mixer, adds butter and sugar, then he adds the semolina and milk mixture. This mixture must be cool so that the eggs don't cook. Once everything is thoroughly blended, the Galacto Bareco custard is ready. The chef now turns his attention to the phyllo dough. He stacks 24 parchment-thin sheets of phyllo and slices them into squares. He places one scoopful of custard in the center of each square. The traditional Greek way is to roll the squares, or bake a large Galacto Bareco in a pan, and then cut it into squares. However, this chef folds over each square to make Lebanese-style triangles. He douses the top with clarified butter, butter that's been boiled to separate out the solids and leave just the oil. Then he bakes the pastries for 45 minutes at 325 degrees Fahrenheit. The golden baked top shines thanks to the clarified butter. The chef cooks the same syrup he made for the baklava, sugar, water, cinnamon, nutmeg, and lemon, and generously drizzles the mixture all over the Galacto Barecos. 
he sprinkles on cinnamon for traditional flavor and some crushed pistachios for decoration. The annual apple harvest is just two months long. To keep apples fresh in storage for several months, growers lower the storeroom oxygen level to put the apples into hibernation. Then they use machines called CO2 scrubbers to absorb and remove the carbon dioxide gas the apples give off. This CO2 scrubber pulls air from the airtight apple storage room through carbon pellets which absorb the CO2 gas molecules. The machine then blows the CO2 free air back into the room. Workers build the machine's frame out of tubular steel. The frame supports all the components, including two sealed vessels filled with carbon pellets. The first vessel starts absorbing CO2, a process called scrubbing, until its pellets are saturated. Then, the second vessel takes over the scrubbing. The first vessel automatically kicks into a regeneration cycle, which blows fresh air through the pellets to remove the CO2 molecules and exhaust them out the building. When the second vessel's pellets max out, vessel one resumes scrubbing, while vessel two regenerates. To construct each vessel, workers weld a steel sheet into a circular shape, then weld on a base and a top ring. The ring has holes along its perimeter for bolting on a lid. They use a ring template to make corresponding holes in the lid, making the exact center of each hole with a punch tool. Then, a worker mounts the lid on a fixture, and following those marks, uses an automated steel punch to perforate the steel. The vessels go to the paint booth for a coat of powder paint, then into an oven to bake the paint. When they come out, the vessels are ready to be filled with carbon pellets and sealed. Once filled to the top, workers lay in a steel baffle. Its holes evenly distribute air passing through the vessel. A worker then places a foam rubber gasket around the perimeter and bolts on the lid tightly. This seals the vessel and prevents the air being blown through it from leaking out. The sealed lid also prevents oxygen from getting into the machine and from there into the apple storage room. Next, workers install the PVC piping that feeds air through the vessels, along with two blowers. One blower pulls air from the apple storage room into the machine for scrubbing. The other sends it back to the room after scrubbing. The airflow through the pipes is controlled by valves, which are wired to the machine's electrical panel. That electrical panel, consisting of relays, pumps, gas analyzers, and a touchscreen, is built in-house in accordance with the required electrical standards of the customer's country. The panel is wired to a computer, which controls the entire operation. Then, a worker installs an electrical box into the machine's frame. And he installs the electrical panel inside the box. Next, the worker connects the wires to the valves, installs the touchscreen, and hooks it up to the computer. The touchscreen lets the machine's operator program oxygen and CO2 target levels specific to the type of apple stored in the room. This is critical, as different varieties of apples give off more CO2 than others. How does it all work? The grower stacks bins of apples in an airtight storeroom. A nitrogen generator feeds in nitrogen to reduce the room's oxygen level to 1.8%. When that happens, the nitrogen feed automatically stops and the continuous CO2 scrubbing automatically begins. Many growers have in-house labs which conduct quality control tests on samples taken from each lot of scrubbed apples coming out of storage. No apples would pass these tests after the two-month harvest season if not for the CO2 scrubbers. CO2 scrubbers lengthen an apple's freshness by about eight months making it possible to bite into crispy apples year-round.